Hi, I'm Dr. Martha Grogan. I'm a cardiologist at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And today I'd like to talk to you about a condition called wild-type transthyretin cardiac amyloidosis. Kind of a long name uh, for a disease that we are increasingly recognizing. So what is amyloidosis? You'll, you'll notice that we have some other videos that explain uh, the condition called amyloidosis. But basically, that's a condition in which proteins become misfolded. So what are proteins? Proteins are substances in your blood that should be dissolved. They should be liquid and they travel through your bloodstream and perform various functions in the body. But in amyloidosis, something goes wrong with those proteins. And instead of being liquid, they become solid and they deposit in the organs and tissues uh, throughout your body and cause uh, problems and various types of uh, diseases. So in other videos, we talk about how amyloid affects the heart. And uh, today I'm gonna just talk about this very specific type of amyloidosis called transthyretin amyloidosis, and even more specifically, what's called the wild type. So wild type transthyretin uh, cardiac amyloidosis. So what is transthyretin? This is a long name, but when you break it down, it's pretty simple. It's a protein in your body that is produced by the liver, and it transports thyroxin or thyroid hormone and retinal binding protein. So two things that your body needs that are transported through the bloodstream by this protein. You can kind of think about it as you know about ground transportation, trucks and trains. Well, these proteins in your body transport uh, substances uh, throughout your bloodstream. And there are two types of transthyretin uh, amyloidosis. One is the hereditary or familial type, and the second is the wild type. It's also called age-related, or previously it was called senile cardiac amyloidosis because it was originally discovered in men who were usually 80 or 90 years old. But now we've gotten rid of that name because we've had patients as young as 47 years old diagnosed with this disease, so we definitely don't consider that to be senile. So today we're really just gonna talk about the wild type transthyretin amyloidosis and specifically how it affects the heart. But to do that, we really need to review how does your heart function. So your heart's about the size of your fist and it's on the left side of your chest. And here we see the heart from the outside with blood vessels along uh, the surface of the heart. And when we open the heart up, you'll see that there are four chambers of the heart. There are two upper chambers that are pretty much collecting chambers. They happen to be called atria. So we have the right atrium and the left atrium. And then the lower chambers are the ones that really do the pumping. They're the ones that pump the blood around your body, and though those are called the right ventricle and the left ventricle. So when we look at this little movie, this will show us more about how does the heart actually uh, work. Um, so the heart is pumping uh, blood. As I said, it's pretty amazing. It actually pumps 2,000 gallons of blood a day. So here you'll see that we have valves in the heart that keep the blood going the right way. And when blood comes back from your body and the oxygen's used up, we call it blue blood, comes back to the right side of the heart here. Now it's pumped out to your lungs. And way out in the really little blood vessels in your lungs, your um, blood picks up oxygen. So now it's red blood and it comes back to the left side of your heart through a valve and then to this left ventricle, the main pumping chamber that's gonna pump blood throughout your whole body, up to your brain, and then through your aorta, to your kidneys, to your whole body. So the reason the heart is divided like this into the right and left sides is so that the blue blood, the blood that's low in oxygen, doesn't mix with the red blood, the blood that has high uh, oxygen uh, content. And when we look at specifically transthyretin type of amyloidosis, the TTR amyloid, that protein is a protein that everyone has. We all have transthyretin, and it happens to be made by the cells in the liver. So here we see individual cells in the liver that are making this uh, uh, protein. So the protein gets released into the bloodstream, and then it circulates around uh, throughout the body. So the transthyretin happens to have four uh, subunits. So you can see that it's a four-headed structure, but in amyloidosis, it breaks apart. So this is the part that shouldn't be happening. It shouldn't be breaking into these smaller units. And when that happens, they kind of glom together 
and then they form what we call fibrils, and that's uh, eventually what leads to amyloidosis. So the TTR really should have stayed as one intact molecule, but instead it's broken apart, it's formed these fibrils. And as one of our hematologists says, it's really like gunk. Then this gunk that's a solid instead of a liquid, it can get into your heart. And we see that what happens here is your heart is made up of all these individual cells. So your heart is a muscle with all these tiny little cells. Each cell is contracting and making the heart beat. But with amyloidosis, you get all these fibrils, this amyloid protein that deposits in your heart. So it, dis it distorts the heart muscle. And you see that the muscle is thick, but it's not thick because it's so strong. It's because it has the amyloid uh, infiltrating in between the individual muscle cells. Now, we'll talk a minute about ejection fractions. So when you learn about the heart, you'll learn that there's a number called ejection fraction. And sometimes people will think, well, if you know that one number, you'll know everything about your heart. And what I want to encourage you is that, especially in amyloidosis, there's never one single number that tells us how severely the heart is affected or if the heart's getting better or worse. So ejection fraction is just the percentage of blood that is pumped out of your heart with every heartbeat. So when we look at um, these movies, you'll see that the heart is beating and uh, it contracts and then it relaxes. And your heart should be nice and elastic. And when it relaxes, that's when it fills with blood. So here we see how much blood was in the left ventricle after it relaxed and how much blood got pumped out. And that's all the ejection fraction is. It's just a percentage of the blood that entered the heart when it was relaxing and how much blood was pumped out. So the normal ejection fraction is in the range of about 55 to 65%. In some kind of conditions, not necessarily amyloidosis, but other more common things, when the heart becomes weak, it stretches out. So now we have an enlarged left ventricle, such as after a heart attack, and there's actually more blood in the heart uh, when it fills and before it contracts. So although it may not squeeze as well, because there's more blood in there to begin with, it can still pump a reasonable amount of blood around. So in certain kind of conditions, um, here you'll see there's still six balls of blood pumped around, um, but there was more blood in there. So the ejection fraction is uh, reduced in this case at 30%. And I know this is a lot of math, but I'm gonna put it all together for you in just a second. So in amyloidosis, I already explained to you that your heart gets thicker. So there's not as much room for blood to get into the heart. In addition, it's stiffer, so your heart should be relaxing. It should be nice and elastic like a, no a normal rubber band, but it's not. It's stiff. It's as if your heart is almost made of concrete. So then it's harder for your heart to fill. So if your heart doesn't fill very much, then it can't pump very much blood out. Even if the actual pumping function seems okay, there just wasn't enough blood in the heart to start with. So that's what this next little example shows us, that the ejection fraction was okay, but not very much blood got pumped around. And that's what happens in amyloidosis. Your heart is not pumping enough blood to meet the demands of your body because it's too uh, stiff and it's not filling properly. So if we um, compare all of these together, one we'll see here's a nice normal heart where about six balls of blood were pumped out and it's a 60% ejection fraction. This heart is enlarged because the muscle is weak. It's either been damaged from a heart attack or some other problem. So it's not squeezing as hard, but because the heart is bigger, there's a reasonable amount of blood still being pumped around, but the ejection fraction is low. In amyloidosis, the ejection fraction is often normal, but the heart is really not normal. And it's not filling very well, so it's not pumping very much blood. And to make things even more complicated, the heart actually, when it pumps, it doesn't just squeeze um, in one direction. It actually is like twisting a towel. If you're wringing a towel and trying to get water out of it, you, you um, squeeze in two different directions, and your heart actually does that. So your heart does a lot more complicated things than just this simple number of ejection fraction. And I like to tell patients not to worry too much about that particular number. As healthcare providers, we want to know some idea. Is your ejection fraction around 10 or 20? Is it 30 or 40, or is it 60%? But it doesn't usually make a big difference if it's 48 versus 56, even though that sounds like a lot when you look at it on some of your reports. 
So what happens in amyloidosis is that as the heart walls become uh, thicker and the heart is stiffer, pressure builds up because it's hard for blood to get into the heart. And then that pressure from the blood vessels in the lungs leaks out in and around the lungs and makes a person short of breath. So that's one of the symptoms of what we call uh, heart failure. And when patients have heart failure, they may be tired because their heart isn't uh, keeping up as much as it should. A person will feel shortness of breath because, again, I mentioned that pressure will build up in the lungs and it's harder to get oxygen in the lungs. We will often see patients sitting up at night because they feel better when they sit up. Some of the fluid then goes down to the bottom of the lungs and help people um, breathe a little bit better. You may notice swelling of the feet or the ankles. That's part of the signs and symptoms of heart failure. Patients might have trouble lying down at night because fluid is coming back and they get short of breath and they might wake up and gasp for air. And often uh, patients might have a cough at night. And some of the other problems that can happen to the heart with amyloidosis are heart rhythm problems. So we have a nice, normal electrical system, most of us in our heart, which should have an electrical signal in the upper chamber uh, of the right atrium that then travels from special uh, pathways down to the lower chambers. And that's a normal heart rhythm, just like you see on TV when it's blip, 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 normal on the monitor. But in amyloidosis, often there are problems where the, there are irregular rhythms, either too fast, too slow, or a very common one called atrial fibrillation, where these upper chambers are just chaotic and they're just quivering. And that's very common, especially in the transthyretin type of amyloidosis. Um, so I mentioned your heart can go too slow, it can go too fast, a person might need a pacemaker, you, one can have irregular rhythms from the uh, upper chambers or the lower chambers of the heart. And it's important to know that if you have atrial fibrillation and transthyretin cardiac amyloidosis, you might need to be on special medications. You might need an electrical shock to get your heart back in normal rhythm. But there is an increased risk of a blood clot, so you really need to be on blood thinners uh, in this uh, condition. And occasionally, patients with transthyretin cardiac amyloidosis, as I mentioned, might need a pacemaker or they might need a defibrillator, a device that can shock the heart if it develops a bad um, heart rhythm. There are some blood tests um, that are commonly abnormal in transthyretin cardiac amyloidosis. One is called tr uh, troponin. That's a protein that's reduced, uh, released from heart muscle. Usually it's due to a heart attack. So your doctors might have con gotten confused and thought you had a heart attack when you really didn't, when it was the amyloidosis. So if yours is elevated, it's important for you just to know that because um, it usually, if it's abnormal, it usually will stay abnormal. And there's something called BNP or NT pro BNP. That's another protein that's released from the heart and it, it goes up. It's higher when the heart is under more stress, when there's more pressure in the heart. But it's important to know that that BNP can vary quite a bit, almost 40% over a week. So when we are looking at your BNP, we really want to look at the overall trend, not so much the day-to-day -day, uh, variations. And the treatment for cardiac amyloidosis depends exactly on what type you have. And in this situation, we're talking about the wild type or the age-related uh, transthyretin cardiac amyloid. And in that situation, most of the symptoms and most of the problems are related to the heart. Patients often may have carpal tunnel syndrome, but they don't usually have a lot of problems outside the heart. Um, so the treatment is to stop the source of the amyloid. And right now there are some agents and medications being uh, developed to try to stabilize that TTR molecule that I showed you, or there are medications to try to even prevent it from being formed. But whether or not this will really help patients, we're not sure that's being tested in what we call clinical trials. Right now, there's no medication that takes amyloidosis out of the heart once it's been deposited, but we do think that um, the body itself can remove some of the deposits over time, and in the future, there might be medications that would help uh, with that process. We use diuretics, which are fluid uh, pills, to try to reduce the shortness of breath and get rid of excess fluid in the body. And often we have to very carefully find the right dose of diuretic for you. So um, it's an individualized uh, process that requires some trial and error. And there are medications that are very common for other type 
of uh, heart failure, particularly uh, medications called beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. And often they won't work so well or they won't be so well tolerated in cardiac amyloidosis. So sometimes we need to uh, reduce those medications or use the lowest dose possible. And the main thing to know is that the medications that work for other kinds of heart failure don't necessarily work for this kind of uh, heart failure. And sometimes you might have had a healthcare provider who put you on those medications before they knew that you had uh, amyloidosis. So the key to the treatment of amyloid is really that it needs to be uh, individualized. So I really thank you for your attention. I hope that this helped you understand a little bit more about uh, cardiac amyloidosis. And if you'd like further information, it's available at mayoclinic.org and also on our Mayo Clinic YouTube channel. Thank you.